It's a pleasant afternoon in June. Mel and his best girl, Thera, are enjoying a ride. Well, he's enjoying it. She's not too happy about the way he drives. He's got a good car and he likes to show what it can do. Hey, you're supposed to slow down for a school crossing. Mel doesn't slow down for anything. See that jalopy up ahead? Watch him pass it. These boys have their opinion of such big shots. Uh-oh. Perhaps Mel's not such a big shot after all. Here we go again. He's used to this. Paying a fine won't be any hardship for Mel. Ticket doesn't mean a thing to a phony like that. Mel's determined to overtake the jalopy and cut the driver down to size. The man wants to know if Mel's going to compete or watch. Mel's going to do whatever that jalopy does, only better. Many boys like Mel were a public problem until in 1950, someone had the idea of turning this abandoned airstrip into a legitimate test course for hot rods. Here, they compete under strict rules designed for safety and fair play. This strip at Santa Ana was so successful that others were opened up across the country. Hundreds of clubs have been formed. The hood lifters, the Arabs, throttle jammers, shifters, chaparrals, knuckle busters, clutchers club, dusters, sidewinders, and others with equally fanciful names. Automatic expulsion faces any member who races on the public highways. As a result, the juvenile nuisance problem has been reduced as much as 90% in some communities. Here's Mel and the jalopy. The flagger thinks Thera better get out. There they go. Sideline experts. Mel can't believe it. Far, far behind. He's humiliated and angry. His one thought is to find Thera and get away. There she is. Talking to the fella that just beat him. He's giving her his card. And she's taking it. This is the last straw. Mel refuses to be impressed. His defeat by the jalopy was a challenge, a challenge he has accepted. He'll have some tall explaining to do about this heap of junk he's bringing home. He knows he can handle his folks. He's equally sure he can breeze through this job he's undertaken. In the next weeks, he learns a lot. 
The most important thing being how little he knows. He makes one trial run after another when nobody's around to see him fail. She cuts out when he gets up over a hundred and he can't figure why. He's too proud to ask for help, although he knows where he can get it. Thera gave him Dave's card. It's hard for him to pocket his pride. Besides, he's not at all sure of his welcome. Dave looks friendly enough. He'll chance it. Wow, what a motor. You've really got something here. Dave thinks Mel ought to enter the big timing meet. They think Mel could turn 150 miles per hour. He hasn't made 120 yet. That's because he needs new wiring and new plugs. Also, he should put in a third carburetor, install an alcohol system, and run on nitro. They'll be glad to help him. Their generosity astonishes Mel. He's joined the fraternity where the car's the thing. The two-day meet has started. Here at Lake El Mirage, the object is not to race car against car, but to see which can obtain the highest speed in its class. The event gives these boys an opportunity to test the cars they've modified for speed and general performance. Many contestants come and spend the night. Among them, Dave and Mel. There's one of the timing officials. He sees to it that safety is the keynote of these meets. Inspectors is rigid. Those that don't pass are eliminated. No boy under 16 is allowed to participate. Those under 21 must have their parents' written consent. Crash helmets are a must. As are safety belts. Accidents are few, but no car is allowed to start unless the ambulance is standing by at the finish line. Since daybreak, the starter has been sending out the cars. This streamliner is next. The loudspeaker tells him to get underway. Very few of these cars have self-starters. He's away! And up to speed as he enters the track. He breaks the first light beam, sets the timing machine in operation. He breaks the second light beam at the finish. The time is registered, announced, and recorded at the board under the starter stand. Car after car goes out. T roadsters. Belly tanks. Chopped coops. Highest speed made today. 168.127 miles per hour. Car 138C, you're next. That's Mel. His hands tremble as he puts on his crash helmet. The official wishes him luck. 138C, take her out. The car fishtailed at the takeoff. 
but he stiff arms her back to the course. Phew, that was close. Hold her steady, Mel. He can see the reason for the safety belt now. Sweat's running down the back of his neck and his helmet weighs about a ton. This is no smooth concrete strip he's traveling. The dry lake bed is full of ruts and bumps. But he's in control now and beginning to enjoy the thrill of the run. He begins to drop off. Now he's in high and praying he'll get past 6,000 revolutions per minute going through the traps. There's the first marker up ahead and the tachometer says 5,900, 5,950, 6,000. He's in the trap now at 6,500. The best he can do. He's out. His time, car 138C turned at 151.06 miles per hour. The time is official. What a welcome awaits him back at the pits. Trophies now instead of traffic tickets. He'll never speed on the highway again. Nor will any of these others. For through this safe and constructive outlet, these boys satisfy their craving for knowledge and speed. Out of their ranks come the engineers who develop improvements for your car and mine, who create new designs and affect economies. These boys of today are the men of tomorrow.